All right, it looks like it is time for us to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. I'm Jennifer Verbeck, and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Maureen Greeley and Tana Russell presenting for us today on Problem Gambling 101. A couple of quick housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for our presenters, please type them into the chat box at any time, and we'll try to answer some as we go along and also reserve a, a couple minutes at the end of the presentation to get to any that we uh, were able to address during the presentation. You'll also be getting um, an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. Um, please make sure you take that survey. It helps us bring the content that you're most interested in. And that email will also have a link to download the slides from today and a link to our website where you'll be able to find a recording of the webinar and that should be available um, later this week. Additionally, everyone who attends this live webinar will get a certificate of, of attendance and that takes us about a week to get those out. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate unless you're watching this in a group. Um, if that's the case, please have someone in the group email us within a business day with the names and email addresses for everyone who wants a certificate. And our email address is up there on the slide. It's northwest at attcnetwork.org. Okay, now on to the webinar. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. We have Maureen Greeley, who is the Executive Director of Evergreen Council on Problem Gambling. And she is also the co-chair of the Washington State Gambling Counselor Certification Committee and the Washington State Problem Gambling Task Force. We also have Tana Russell, who is the Assistant Director of Evergreen Council on Problem Gambling. And she is also a nationally certified tobacco treatment provider. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenters. Thank you so much. I'll let Tana get the slides up in front of us. Wonderful. So thank you. We are so excited to be here once again with Northwest ATTC. This has been a partnership that has been growing this year and we're thrilled to be working together with everyone. As Jennifer said, I am Maureen Greeley. I'm the Executive Director of the Evergreen Council on Problem Gambling. I have been in this field for more than 20 years in prevention, education, advocacy, and outreach around gambling disorder, addictions, problem gambling. And I'll let Tana introduce herself when she comes on in just a little bit. She is our assistant director, but she has vast knowledge in training as well as clinical work in our field. So you have a wonderful trainer with you here today. We do wanna take a moment along with a Northwest ATTC to acknowledge that our trainings when we are in the Pacific Northwest are offered, even though we're virtual, we're all here on lands that are tribal lands. And we want to thank and respect that tribal sovereignty and the ability to be able to be with you now on this very important subject. So let's start with a little bit of a background of the Evergreen Council on Problem Gambling. Some of you may have heard of us before. Some of you may be meeting us for the first time today. We are a nonprofit organization and we have been in business um, founded 30 years ago in May, 1991. So we're very excited to be celebrating that milestone event. I always say to people, please don't go home and say you had the anti-gambling presentation today because we are not in any way, shape or form anti-gambling or gaming. We exist solely for the purpose to ensure that treatment prevention, education, awareness, services for people who are impacted negatively by gambling and gaming, and the co-occurring disorders that go with those disorders receive the assistance they need. That could be individuals, that could be families, that could be employers who are looking for ways to help employees stay healthy or to be responsible members of their communities. So our mission is about helping people. 
That's okay, Tani, you did great. You can move on. Um, we're also excited this year that we just recently launched our new and improved website, which we hope will make it easier for people to connect with us for the most important reason, getting information, but also being able to find ways to get more education. So while we're here with Northwest ATTC today, you'll see here just a few things that Tana will talk more about in a bit, but we have a number of live streaming events, podcasts, free educational sessions that will bring you more information about a wide variety of topics on gambling, gaming disorder, mental health issues, co-occurring recovery community efforts. So we hope that you'll take a moment to visit our website and see those new ways to connect with us. One of the ways that we do our most important work is in training. We have become very well known as a leader in training around gambling and gaming disorder, not only in the Pacific Northwest, but around the country. And we do have continuing education available. I noticed someone in the chat was asking that question. Our education programs are approved for continuing educations by a number of associations. A few of them are listed here. If you do not see the accrediting organization that you're looking for, Send a chat, let us know. Tana can, can let you know if they are currently one of our accrediting organizations or if we need to reach out to them to get accreditation from them. You'll see a long listing there in the upper right-hand corner of the types of trainings we do, not only online, but self-directed trainings. We do face-to-face -face trainings. We haven't done those in the last year and a half, but we're excited to um, note that we will be back in person for our Focus on the Future conference next spring. So if you have any questions about the types of trainings, you can see all of these trainings on our website. You can get a feel for the types of things we've done. Also important to all of you and to us and to the people we serve is to make sure that we have many gambling counselors in our state and in our regions. We don't have enough. I don't know if we'll ever have enough, but because we have some vast geographic locations, including a lot of rural locations, we really are working hard to increase the number of certified gambling counselors that we have in our region. So I'm gonna turn this over to Tana, let her talk a little bit more about the next training for core counseling training, and then she'll take it away for the rest of the day. I'll be here with you. I'll be checking the chat as well with Jennifer and the folks from Northwest ATTC. And if there's anything I can help answer, I will do that along the way. Thank you again for letting us be here. And Tana, take it away. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'm Tana Russell. My specialties are in both tobacco and gambling. And this training is designed to give clinicians the foundation to start doing gambling treatment. And I just want to be very clear to everyone. This is a, a certification. It's a two-year process. Uh, the training is just the first step that gets people going. Uh, so it's important to realize the training itself isn't the license, right? But it is the start of that. And so we really encourage people to do that. As far as certification and licensing processes go, it's, it's, it's very easy compared to getting a mental health or an SUDP license. It builds on that foundation of understanding and best counseling practices. So, and you know, once people get the bug for this work, they just keep diving into more because it, it never, it never ends. And it's so incredibly rewarding. So I do have slides towards the end, giving a bit of an overview of the, the certification itself. If I have time to get to that, I can, but you can certainly review that on your own. Shoot me an email if you have questions, et cetera. Maureen mentioned these different ways to connect. <clears throat> we have two live streaming series, ECPG Live and Kaleidoscope. We have a podcast and we have a YouTube page that is chock full of amazing educational videos. 
uh, and also a blog and e-newsletter. While none of these are necessarily classified as training for CE credit, they are 100% just as educational and they're free and they're on demand and you can watch them anytime. So I really encourage you guys to check that out if you want some more information. There's only so much we can cram into an hour here with you today. So you can definitely dive deeper into things that you're most interested in. Uh, we all, I always like to start with a quick trigger warning just to be respectful to anyone who is in recovery from gambling and gaming by the nature of this training. It may have text images, audio, video, or other media depicting gambling elements and video games for educational purposes. So if this is triggering, please mute, minimize, step away from your computer as needed. Just take care of yourself there. Our main learning objective here today is to give you a foundation and understanding of gambling problem, gambling and gambling disorder. We're also gonna make sure you know where to go to get more training and information should you want it. We've just talked about some of those, plus the end of the slide deck is basically an entire resource book for you. So you can flip through uh, your resources of choice and also know where to, to learn more about becoming a certified gambling counselor. So I have a quick polling question for you. I've just launched it, so you can go ahead and start reviewing it. And what we want to know is, what are you most interested in? These are some of the things that I will be covering in the presentation today, touching on each of these. But if there's any area that most of you are most interested in, what we can do is camp out there just a little bit longer, maybe put our Q&A there so we can get you uh, the information you're most interested in knowing about. Thank you. I see all of the responses to this poll coming in. We're at about 50% now. I'll give you another minute to keep throwing in uh, your interest there. And of course we can do more trainings later on, plus some of these, uh, these topics have a YouTube video on our channel. So you can also dive, dive in more there. I'll give another few seconds for a few more people to respond for gambling, responsible gambling, healthy play, risk and protective factors, problem gambling impacts the ripple effect through relationships, public health, I do have a case example, a couple of them, and then some clinical stuff, DSM, ACM screening, et cetera. And it looks we're, like we're at about 65%. So I'm going to end the poll there. And it looks like what people are most interested in is the first couple things on gambling, responsible gambling, healthy play, and risk and protective factors. So that's great. Uh, we'll take some Q and A in there. And also Maureen is keeping an eye on the chat and moderating that and can also be answering questions for everyone via the chat as we go. Thank you, I appreciate that. And of course, by the time we get to the end, I think you have a survey to complete. So you can give us some more feedback there too if there's other topics you're interested in. First, let me set the stage here between what constitutes is just a game versus a gambling game. Right, there's a, a lot of games that we like to play, games where no bets or wagers are made. They may be simple board games, card games, most video games, etc. cetera. Uh, but gambling, the three main criteria for classifying and regulating something as gambling is the prize, chance, and consideration. Meaning there's something they're putting up for consideration, some sort of investment of something of value for the chance to win a prize. Now. It's not just about uh, they might lose out on the prize, but a person can also lose out on the investment they, they made in the first place. And that is a part of the gamble. There's also a difference between making a purchase and something that's a gamble, right? You make a purchase when you go to the grocery store. You see the product, you see the price, you put it in your cart, you buy it, and that's it. There are purchases, say, and this is an, an example from our Blurred Lines presentation in video games, they have stores. People can go to the store, they advertise a certain skin or product, they purchase that, it's just a purchase. But where something may start crossing the lines into a gamble is when that product being received is unknown, such as an example of maybe loot boxes where I'm buying a box, but I don't know what I'm getting. I'm hoping to get some great legendary item, but it might be stuff I already have, right? So there's a difference between 
a game versus a gamble and a purchase versus a gamble. So when I use the word gamble, I don't mean the gamble of getting in your car and driving somewhere because there's risky drivers on the road. I mean, very specifically, there's prize chance consideration there. So we're going to play a little bit of a trivia. I don't have these as polling questions, but you can just put your answers in the chat. Uh, which is correct? With the, what is the definition of problem gambling? Is it A, when someone gambles every day and spends at least 500 per week? Or is it B, a term used loosely to refer to any range of problems associated with gambling from losing more than you can afford to a severe loss of control cravings and major life problems. And I see some answers coming in. And if you said B, that is correct. And I'll give you an example of why A is not, right? So I had a coworker once, he did a gambling screen. He's getting comfortable with this. And he's like, I don't think this person has a gambling problem. They only gamble twice a month. I said, I'm so glad you did the screen. But what happens twice a month financially for a lot of people? Payday. Payday happens twice a month. And this was kind of an example where the screen didn't quite ask enough questions because maybe that twice a month was a dollar and it was fine. Or maybe that twice a month was his entire paycheck when it came in. Right. So the number of days a person is gambling doesn't actually tell us anything about how, what kind of problems they're experiencing. Equally, the, the amount of money they're spending doesn't tell us anything either. Because for one person, $50 a week is their pocket change, not impacting other areas, not causing problems in their home, not causing stress. For another person, $500 a week is all they have. Now they're, they're struggling to eat, they're struggling to pay rent, et cetera. So it is about the problems they are experiencing from it, not the number of days or amount of money. Compulsive gambling, is this A, a term generally used to describe compulsive gambling behaviors, coined by Gamblers Anonymous and not used diagnostically, or is it B, someone who has gambled every dollar to the point of living under a bridge? Is it A or B? If you are saying A, you are correct. If you were to go to the Gamblers Anonymous website or look at any of their literature, this is going to be the term you'll see. Uh, but it is not exclusive to that environment you're going to hear elsewhere. However, if a person comes to a certified gambling counselor and says, I think I'm addicted to gambling, can you help me? And the counselor does an assessment, this will not appear in their chart. It is not a diagnosis. Next, pathological gambling. Some of you might have heard this. You might have said it. Where does this come from? What does this mean? Is it A? when a person resorts to lying, cheating, and stealing to support their gambling habit, or B, the diagnostic term used in the DSM-4 prior to the publication of the DSM-5 in May 2013. Which is it? I see some answers coming in. I'm seeing some A's coming in. It is B, believe it or not. But a lot of people think it's A on this. They've heard it before. And one of the reasons for that is when we hear the word pathological, often what comes to mind for people is lying, cheating, and stealing. However, it was the diagnostic term used in the DSM-4 until it was changed. So I encourage you not to use this term in your vocabulary because it tends to be associated with these more stigmatizing things. And I also encourage you not to be too judgmental if you do hear it. If you see it in a piece of research, check the date. Nine times out of 10, it's prior to 2013. It was the uh, clinical term to use for years and years and years. Now, moving on from there, if you were just paying attention, gave you a hint on this one. Gambling disorder, is it A, a silly phrase that professionals use to talk about someone's moral ineptitude? Or is it B, the current diagnosis according to the DSM-5? Mild, moderate, or severe gambling disorders can be episodic or persistent or an earlier sustained remission. Yep, I see a lot of Bs coming in. This is it. The DSM-5 changed pathological gambling to gambling disorder. It has the same specifiers as substance use disorder, mild, moderate, or severe. Also, earlier sustained remission is the same. 
Early remission means no symptoms for three months plus. Sustained remission means no symptoms for 12 months plus. What is different about gambling disorder that SUDs don't have is episodic or persistent. Persistent meaning the symptoms have been persistent. Episodic mean the symptoms come and go with months in between. One example of this, not limited to this, but just an easy example to give is with sports betting. So sports are seasonal. So a person may have severe gambling disorder symptoms during the sports season they bet on. And when that season ends, if they don't bet on any other sports and don't do any other kind of gambling, they might not gamble at all until the next season runs around. So that's just one example of how uh, episodic gambling disorders can happen. Lastly, bonus question, what is professional gambling? There's a lot of misconceptions on this one. Is it A, someone who gambles on skill-based games as a profession, usually are sponsored, generally just not display life problems associated with their gambling, or B, someone who's so good at a gambling game that they win more than they lose? Yes, I'm seeing a lot of A's coming in. You are correct. However, you may hear someone refer to themselves as a professional gambler. That doesn't mean they are one, right? They may fancy themselves to be one, uh, but professionals, this is their job. It's not eight to five, Monday to Friday job. They usually have to travel around to where the tournaments are. There may be someone who's sponsoring them, paying their travel, their hotels, even sponsoring some of the money they may be gambling with. Generally don't display, display life problems, meaning they're, they treat it as a job. It's not used to self-medicate or, or, or de-stress, although it can it can become problematic even for people who have done it professionally. So why language matters? I asked you to maybe abstain from using the pathological gambling terms simply because of the stigma associated around lying, cheating, and stealing that gets um, uh, some word association with it. But there's other terms we want to refrain from as well. Stigma is not doing us any favors in the fight to help get people help. Uh, in my opinion, stigma can be very, very deadly because it translates into a person doesn't know that what they're dealing with is an addiction. They don't know that there's help available. They don't want to ask for help. They don't want to open up about it. And when they're living with the stigma all the time, it can feel like I am such a problem as opposed to there's a disorder that can be treated. And some of you may have seen some uh, language charts floating around. And I've made one for you here about gambling terms, as opposed to calling someone a gambler, there's someone who gambles. As opposed to calling someone an addict, it's a person with an addiction, with an addiction and order disorder affected by addiction, etc. Instead of referring to a person as a problem or as a person as a disorder, no, they are a person who has problem gambling, a person with gambling disorder. And this is, this is one that is frequently getting more traction these days if you haven't heard this word change yet, um, as opposed to using relapse recurrence. This is just more compassionate. And I equate this to uh, referring to someone as their medical condition, like a diabetic or cancer patient versus someone who has diabetes or cancer. And I say that from a perspective of my grandmother died from cancer. To me, she was not a cancer patient. She was my grandma. She happened to have cancer. So it's just more respectful and compassionate to the individual and their families. It takes a little more brain power, maybe a few more words, but not that hard. It's, it's very, very worth it. And of course our language continues to grow and change over the years. And thank you. And, and Maureen uh, made a good point in the chat. We want to acknowledge that these are public health issues and that they're integrated into our conversations. We'll talk a little bit more about that. If you're not too familiar with gambling, not, not your thing, not been around it, here's a real, real quick in a nutshell overview, okay? There's table games like poker, blackjack, dice games. Uh, there's paper games, lottery tickets, scratch-offs, keno, pull tabs, bingo. 
there's slot machines, and there's several different type of machine games. Some of them are random number generators. Some of them are virtual scratch tickets or virtual lottery tickets. There's different programming that goes into that. There's different ways that they work, but the look and feel and the experience of the person sitting in front of it, they're all very, very similar there. Here's a few video resources for you. They're only a few minutes each. Uh, I, these are like my go-to videos for explaining losses disguised as wins, what the stop button does and doesn't do, and that they're not, slot machines don't work like conveyor belts. The longer you play does not increase your chances of winning. It does not make sense to go over your budget to keep playing. So these really explain that very, very well. While they are specific to the programming of the random number generator, some of, some of the concepts are, are are still relevant for other types of machines as well, such as playing longer past what you can afford doesn't make sense even for the other types of, of machines either. Ways of understanding. Okay. And then of course, there's also uh, sports and racing games, sports betting, horse racing, dog racing, and some illegal like dog fighting or cock fighting, et cetera, that are other gambling games. There's modern gambling where things are more digitized, gambling with skins. I can't get into this world of things too much in this hour, but if you if you get a chance to take one of our blurred line sessions, it's an entire training of, of the blurred lines of gaming and gambling and how that looks, such as loot boxes, which have been directly linked to problem gambling and problem video gaming. And also uh, the rise of Esports, fantasy sports, daily sports, and kind of an overlap with uh, the gamification of that and gambling on esports tournaments, which is esports are competitive video game tournaments. And some things that people don't often consider to be gambling, but are, are betting on games with family or friends. You love them, it's all in good fun. But if there's betting on the game, it's still gambling. Bingo, lottery tickets, raffle tickets, scratch-offs, fantasy sports, app gambling games, skins betting. And there's also things out there that are simulated gambling elements, which may not be uh, gambling in, in, in its most specific legal definition, but are still in the spirit of gambling, such as apps like Coin Master with a slot machine element, Duolingo. I love this app to brush up on my Spanish, but even it has a gambling element where you wager your virtual currency to maybe get more virtual currencies you buy for language learning stories and things. And then some more simplified versions, you know, or there's spin wheels and things. For a person say in recovery from a gambling disorder who is looking for some app, <laughs> learn a language or something and gets discovers these, it can be triggering. It's just really important to be aware of what's out there and that we face it all the time. So I'm not gonna have you answer these verbally for the sake of time, but I want you to think about these for just a second. Um, and this can be a great conversation starter with your clients, with your coworkers, with your family, friends, just to get the, the conversation onto gambling in a way that's not threatening. It's not judgmental, anything like that, but elevate some awareness a little bit. Think about how old you were the first time you ever gambled and what it taught you. So people first start experimenting with uh, tobacco, alcohol, substances, usually around 14, 15, 16 years old with gambling, it's a lot younger, right? We're looking seven, eight, nine, 10 years old. And for video gaming, it's as young as two or three years old, right? But what did it teach you about gambling? My great grandmother had an old fashioned like lever slot machine in her living room, right? Uh, <laughs> smoked two packs a day, told dirty jokes, had a slot machine in her living room. This was my great grandmother. And she'd give, give us a bag of nickels. We'd stick all the nickels in it. They'd all eventually go away. Even if you won, she'd come out, unlock the back, give us our nickels back. We'd play again, right? It taught me that the long, if you play long enough, you're going to lose your nickels, right? That's what I learned from gambling at a very, very young age. Do you know someone with a gambling problem? How can you tell? What are the signs you've seen? And I would I would ask you to consider, are you even right? 
is there actually a gambling problem or maybe not in, and you're interpreting some, something else going on? And what does society communicate about problem gambling? If you think about where it's come up in movies, TV shows, books, conversations, et cetera, you can kind of get an understanding of why people who do have a problem don't particularly want to talk about it because it is not portrayed very nicely in our society. It's, it's, it usually treats them like someone that just selfish or arrogant or just disregards everybody. And that's generally not true. A lot of times these are people that are our coworkers, our family, our friends, and they just happen to have this struggle. On a continuum, and the chart not to scale here, okay? Uh, there are some people who don't gamble, some gamble casually. This could be um, on vacations, occasional lottery tickets, etc. serious social where these are the people who see it as a hobby. It's something they, they budget for. It's something that's uh, more frequent or part of their routine, harmful involvement or at risk, or maybe even problem gambling. So they may be seeing it as a source of income, maybe starting to chase some losses, uh, maybe blowing their, their budget on it a little bit more. And gambling disorder specifically means it's to the level of a diagnosis. Four out of nine diagnostic criteria apply at this point. It's important to note that gambling problems aren't limited to just this end. Gambling problems happen in the whole end of the spectrum. For example, with casual gambling, just as with alcohol, a person may uh, drink too much one night and have some regrets the next day. It doesn't mean they have an alcohol use disorder. That can happen in a similar way with gambling. They may go on vacation, blow their budget, be regretting it for the next three months. Doesn't necessarily mean they have a gambling disorder, though they have just experienced some gambling related problems. Even for people who do not gamble at all, they can still experience gambling related problems due to someone else's gambling, particularly if they live in the same household. So I wanna just, completely scratch the misconception that only people with a disorder suffer. <laughs> okay. It can happen anywhere on the continuum and you can provide help services to all of these people. We're not looking just, just for the ones on the very end. We, we can provide services to help on, on this entire continuum, which is really, really great. So there is responsible gaming for gaming establishments and for the players themselves, some things they can do. For the gaming establishments, uh, there's certain things they can do to help, to, to try to help protect their uh, guests. Uh, part of that is helping to prevent underage gambling, just like uh, alcohol establishments try to prevent underage drinking, etc. cetera. Um, having uh, the helpline accessible, having responsible gaming training for their whole staff, uh, self-exclusion, and ECPG has a program specifically designed to do this, okay? So if you work at, for, near a, a gaming establishment and they're interested in a specialized training for their staff, this is what we do. It's called RG Star, Responsible Gaming and Staff Training and Resources. We train the frontline employees, the supervisors, managers, train up ambassadors on how to uh, listen to statements which would be concerning, have a conversation and refer that person to help. Don't train them to be counselors. That's not their job, but they can refer them to the counselors to help address the situation for them. For players, there's things they can do to protect themselves. Um, some of it is the same, like preventing underage gambling from th the people in their own life. Also setting their own time limits and money limits, <clears throat> their uh, point of mind when they go play, treating it as a form of entertainment. It's just for fun. Losing is part of it. Consider it paying to play a game. And sometimes people hear me say that and they're like, well, why would I pay to play a game? I've got games in my closet. Well, you go to pay to play these games because you don't have these games in your closet, right? And the, uh, the chance to win is what adds to the fun of it. But because you can't predict, you're not guaranteed any wins whatsoever, you expect to lose, you consider it a, a purchase of entertainment, okay? 
Uh, you don't borrow money to gamble from other people or yourself. So it's not the rent money. It's not the grocery money. It's not the bill money. It's not your miscellaneous, miscellaneous spending money. It is your money budgeted for entertainment. That's the only place it should be coming from. Shouldn't interfere with other areas of your life. Just like going to see a movie shouldn't be causing family dysfunction. Going to gamble shouldn't be causing family dysfunction. Uh, you don't gamble to win back losses. You're, again, because you're going expecting to lose. So you only spend what you are okay with losing and then th that's it. So you're not put out by it. Uh, you don't gamble to get money. You don't gamble to cope with emotional or physical pain. This is the, the self-medicating portion with ju just like substances. The moment someone starts to self-medicate, doing that activity in order to not have to feel stress, depression, overwhelmed, anxiety, whatever, it has just started training the brain to see that activity as a solution to a problem rather than just a recreation. Same thing works for gambling. And that starts that downward spiral of addiction quite quickly, because then the next time they have a bad day or have that emotion and their brain thinks, well, what's going to make me feel better the fastest. It now has a memory of the gambling substance use, et cetera, to say, oh, that worked. You should go do that again. And if you do that, every time you have a bad day, the addiction will set in pretty quickly. Now, this is very difficult for most people to stick with. Now you add on top with that, someone who's dealing with trauma, with ADHD, with PTSD, with some other mental health diagnosis, with the pre-existing substance use disorder, when something bad just happened in their life, this all, be, all of a sudden becomes almost impossible, right? So it's important to be compassionate and keep that in mind. So risk and protective factors. This is one of the other areas you guys wanted to, to know more about. So I want to make sure we address any uh, questions while we're here. And Maureen, I see some things coming in the chat. Please just interrupt me and let me know if you want me to speak to anything in there, but it looks like you've got that covered. So just like with substances, there are biological factors that nobody chooses that can put them at risk. If I was in the room with you, I would do this little exercise and ask everybody, raise your hand. You can raise your virtual hand or put it in the chat if you want. Okay. Raise your hand. If at some point in your life, you have learned that quote unquote, alcoholism is hereditary, or in my terms, a predisposition to an alcohol use disorder can run in your family. I see. Oh, good. I see a lot of virtual hands raised. Yes. We learn this. I'm so glad that we learned this. You can put your virtual hands down. Now raise your hand if at some point in your life, you have learned the, that the exact same thing is true for gambling disorder. The number is going down, not up. <laughs> okay. Like <laughs> we're not taught this. It is the exact same thing. What's also really curious is that substance use, mental health, gambling, uh, these disorders, and I cannot explain this in any more detail than what I'm doing right now because there's professionals who go to school for a lot longer than I did to study this, okay? But they share a genetic component that results in if you have a family member who say has an alcohol use disorder, that does not just put you at risk of an alcohol use disorder. That puts you at risk of any substance use disorder and gambling and other mental health disorders. So what ends up happening, what I had seen quite a lot is a person who had a family member with a, let's say a substance use disorder, and they grew up experiencing problems from that. So they never touched it, never touched anything. They end up with a gambling disorder and they end up in treatment. They end up in my office saying, what, what went wrong? I did so good. I never touched substances. Now I have this, holy cow. I am exactly like mom or dad, right? Because no one ever told them that mom or dad's substance use disorder put them at risk of a gambling disorder. And they showed the capacity to make a really responsible decision in their life by not using those things. Had anybody ever told them 
that gambling disorder was a risk just as equal to substance use disorder, they probably never would have done it because they chose not to do it with the substances. So they have that capacity to make that decision, but no one ever gave them that information. So anyway, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, personality traits, uh, impulsiveness, competitiveness, et cetera. One reason that athletes can be at high risk for gambling disorder, right? Competitiveness is great on a field, right? Not so great in a gaming establishment. Gender and ethnicity. So men tend to start gambling younger and tend to take longer to develop a disorder, whereas women tend to start gambling later in life and the gambling disorder sets more rapidly. Not a rule, can happen other ways, but that's just a trend. And of course, with ethnicity in some cultures, gambling is more prevalent, more accepted. It's part of the culture, it gets encouraged, et cetera. And of course, that does put some people at more, at more risk there. Protective factors of things don't run in your family and you have some adaptive personality traits. Some people, some kids even are just born naturally more cautious. They may naturally be better at asking for help for things, whereas other kids are maybe naturally more risk takers, more independent. I got this on my own, leave me alone, right? So there's certain personality traits that they're just born with, uh, but you can also learn. You can learn to ask for help. Uh, you can learn to uh, slow down, set goals, make sacrifices now because the long-term payoff is worth it. You can learn all of that as well. Environmental risk factors could be things going on in life, life stressors, divorce, work problems, financial problems, trauma relationship issues, health or mental health issues. Gambling can act as a pain reliever for some people sometimes. If you've ever been kind of mildly sick, but if you, if you stayed busy and kept distracted, it wasn't that bad, right? Kind of that idea, but with gambling, it's, it's way more. So it helps people to not feel as much pain or maybe they have mobility issues. So their, their choice of activities is somewhat limited but maybe the casino is, is safe for their body. It's a safe environment. They're comfortable. So that's an activity they feel good doing. Um, and of course, any mental health issues going on, maybe other times in their life, it wouldn't have been appealing, but right now, based on what they're dealing with, gambling might feel effective at coping with that. And it can be effective in the long run, but then gambling related problems tend to cause or worsen mental health issues because of this, the stress, anxiety, relationship issues, trouble sleeping, health issues, all of that related to it. Protective factors, uh, their coping skills, whether they learned it because they did treatment before for a substance use disorder, those are coping skills they can use in their recovery from gambling. Other coping skills in life, the support they have in their family, their sense of spirituality, if they've had treatment for other things they can rely on. So I'm gonna stop there for a second and see if we've got any questions on neurobiology. This is not, I'm not gonna talk about neurobiology in here, but I do have a resource on it in the resource section. Let me, Here we go. This one. Uh, this is the increasing the odds from the National Center on Responsible Gambling. You'll see this is volume six. I think they've got eight total. They're all about problem gambling and they are all fantastic. This one is specifically on gambling in the brain and why neuroscience research is vital to gambling research. And it's, it's a really, really great resource. So if you want some more on neurobiology, I encourage you to check that one out. Good question. All right. So quickly, I'm going to skip around here a little bit for the sake of time. I want you to be aware that gambling has physical health issues. A lot of these tie back to uh, the chronic stress that it has. We know that stress causes health issues. Gambling related problems cause stress and it doesn't go away quickly. 
So a lot of stress-induced physical health issues, the very sedentary activity. So not a lot of um, moving around, maybe less exercise. Uh, dehydration from not drinking enough fluids, drinking too much alcohol, using more tobacco, either malnutrition from skipping meals or eating more junk food than they would normally, et cetera. Mental health issues. We've kind of already covered that a bit. Suicide is a uh, gambling disorder has higher rates of suicide ideation and attempts than other addiction disorders. It is a deadly disease. It is lethal. People do die from this. People think, well, a behavior can't kill anybody. Oh yes, it can. <laughs> okay. So this, I consider our work at ECBG to be life-saving work. In fact, I, I had a, I had a caller calling for a, a family member connected him to help. And he told me specifically, I want you to know you're saving lives. Made my day, makes it all worth it. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, substance use and recovery. If a person is in treatment for substance use, no one ever asks them about their gambling. No one ever screens them for gambling. No one ever identifies that they're dealing with gambling related problems. Guess what? They're going to struggle being successful in that treatment program for substances because they're not being treated as a whole person. The gambling impacts their triggers for substances directly and vice versa. It's very, very important to treat the whole person. And it's the responsibility of the professional to set the safe space to bring it up. Uh, there is crime associated with this. It does affect family and relationships 100%. So if I drink, I get intoxicated, but you don't. But with gambling, I can gamble your paycheck. I can gamble our, college, our, our kid's college fund. I can gamble our next mortgage payment. I can gamble your retirement. I can take the money from work. I can use my company credit card to gamble with. So the ripple effect is just huge. Um, of course it can affect work and not just from taking time away from work to be at the casino, but also things like collections callers, calling and harassing them while they're on the job. The distraction of the stress uh, affecting them to where they can't be as productive as well and also finances. Substance use, of course, is expensive and can cause financial problems, but gambling disorder by its nature tends to cause bigger financial problems a lot faster. When you get the handout, I do have a slide on each of those, kind of giving you some more examples, uh, but I'm gonna skip them for the sake of time here. If you want, a good case example. Um, I had one I was going to share with you, but I'd rather do some more Q&A at the end and refer you here. This is Bobby and his sister Rhonda um, is an amazing advocate who's been doing advocacy for 25 years. And we just had her yesterday. I just recorded a podcast episode with her on this story. I encourage you to listen to it. It'll come out September, around September 29th, which was his birthday, which is Problem Gamblers Awareness Day in, in Oregon. So I encourage you to read his story because it puts a face on it because sometimes people forget, you know, this is not just a statistic, right? These are people's brothers, sons, daughters, spouses, grandmothers, grandfathers, grandchildren, uh, who are affected by this. And it's, uh, it's a huge impact, not just for the individual, but for their families dealing with it as well. So I really, really encourage you to uh, check out their website and read that story to put a face on it so that when you think about problem gambling, you've got a face that comes to mind until you start seeing clients for yourselves, you'll have even more faces that come to mind. Um, and a quick paradigm shift because people ask, well, where does, where does problem gambling go? Does it go with mental health? Does it go with SUD? Uh, I would say yes, yes to both. And I'm going to refer you to the American Psychiatric Association to make my case here, right? If you look at uh, the DSM, it is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And if you open this sucker up, 
to page 41, you're going to find all of the substance related addictive disorders, all the substances, boom, 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 lined up there. And within that section is the non-substance related disorders, including gambling disorders. And it wasn't until I was actually making this slide that I noticed they have an S on the end, but there's just one in there. And of course, rumor has it, they may add more such as gaming disorder to the same section. So yes, gambling disorder is an addictive disorder, which is a mental disorder. So take that to whoever you need to take that to, to start screening for these in your programs <laughs> and referring for treatment. Uh, this is our, our, is, I don't remember if Maureen said this at the beginning, but this is our year for really pushing integration here. Uh, it, it is part of what people deal with in their mental health and in their addiction uh, settings. There's a lot of validated screening tools and even non-validated, but still useful screening tools out there in your handout in the PDF of these slides at the very, very bottom, I have included for you the BBGS because it's four questions. It's very easy and it will have the scoring guide right with the handout and the resources of where to refer them to right on the screen. So I cannot make it any easier for you to start integrating gambling screens into that. And we can do a whole session on screening best practices, et cetera, at a later time. Um, and help options. What help is there to people who are looking for help for gambling? There are community recovery support services like GA or Gammonon, which are 12-step, right? There's AA and NA. There's also GA. Same, similar structure. There's also community recovery services like cafes, recovery peer coaches, there's treatment, there's outpatient and residential, there's individual group and family treatment. And then there's other things like recovery podcasts, social media support sites, think outside the box a little bit here, but these are fantastic for being accessible 24 seven because you can't call your counselor at three o'clock in the morning when there's a crisis, right? So having things like this uh, this is like a whole package of recovery capital for people who are looking for help for their gambling. And if they can do some of all of these, then they've got a lot of support uh, to help them be successful. And when making a referral, so I've given you the BBGS gambling screen. It has the helpline on there. It has our website on there. It has GA and Gammon on, on there and another website, gamblersandrecovery.org. It's got all of those on there. And someone says, I don't think I have a gambling problem. Why, why are you telling me this? Here's what you can say, right? You're not forcing anybody to do anything. You're just providing services. What you can tell them is, the screen just says there might be a problem. I'll refer you to a specialist to take it from there. What a specialist can do, what a certified gambling counselor can do is give an informed professional recommendation because they'll do a whole assessment, right? There's mental health assessments, there's SUD assessments, they'll do a gambling assessment and make a recommendation from that. They can talk to you about what kinds of gambling problems are worth being concerned about and why. I, I, that's my language there. And the reason I word it like that is because to me, all gambling related problems are worth being concerned about, but to the client, maybe they aren't. So it's a little bit more relatable to what they're feeling. Um, but to me, all gambling related problems are worth being concerned about. What kind of help is available? What kind of treatment is available? They can tell them, here's our treatment program. Here's that treatment program. Here's what it would look like for you. What resources are available for family and loved ones? Give them tools for limit setting and money management. So a gambling counselor can do all of these things. And of course, you can always call the helpline 24 seven, choice is yours anytime you want. If sometime later you wanna call it, it's there. And ultimately it's their decision. It's your choice. I wanna give you the resources in case you or someone you know wants them. And it's really, really important to frame it for, it's not just you, but it's also for someone you know. They're more likely to take it, have it on hand, and who knows, it might help them later, might help someone else later. So, and you have the helpline here. So with our last few minutes, I'm gonna stop there. When you get the handouts, there is more here about um, just giving you a bit of a glimpse of ASAM 
and the certification process. You don't necessarily need me to read that stuff to you though. So Maureen, are there any uh, questions that we might want to talk about for the next few minutes or some themes that came up in the chat? Thanks, Tana. Um, obviously, the neurobiology is one that could be a whole semester long process. Yep. Um, I think that there was interest early on in also hearing a little more about how to become a certified problem gambling counselor. So you might spend a minute or two on that as well. And I am also putting the national helpline in the chat box. Um, the helpline you see here is the Washington State helpline number. Many states have their own, but there is also a national helpline number that anyone from any location can call. Perfect. Yeah, so there is an international gambling counselor certification. People all over the country can get this one. Oregon has a state level. Washington has a state level. I did look up Alaska and Idaho. I don't think I looked at Montana. They don't have a, a state level to my, to my knowledge, unless I'm wrong there, but they would get the international. Okay. And all the links are right here where you can go and look up the requirements. In general, it is have a license in mental health marriage and family, psychology, et cetera. So these, this gambling counselor certification is generally an add-on for people who have already been counselors in, in their field before. Um, generally requires either a bachelor's or an equivalent. In Washington state, we have an equivalency, which is to be an SUDP for at least two years. Uh, there's a training requirement of 30 hours of training, which is, this right here. And if you plan to get the international license, you can take our 30 hour training and it will count for that. We're approved by the IGCCB for that training program. So any of you can sign up for our gambling counselor core training, whether you plan to get the Washington certification or the international account for either. Um, I hope that explains there are different levels. When you get the handout, I have kind of outlined for you, here's the requirements for the international. And I just did Washington because it would get too cluttered to do more than two. Uh, but 30 hours of training, have to have a hundred hours of gambling counseling experience with a supervisor. So you're not out there on your own. You have a supervisor who's been doing this a lot longer to help walk you through and, and consult on cases. And there's also a, a level two, so you can go up and eventually you can also become a supervisor if you stick with it long enough and then you can start supervising other people as well. So I hope that gives you the general idea. Usually it starts with the training for people. Any other questions? Thank you, Maureen, for putting both the, uh, all the helplines in there. Sure. I think the other thing we might want to mention is every state is different in how the state supports treatment and prevention. Oregon has some fantastic prevention programs. Washington has really strong treatment support in terms of free or low cost treatment to reimburse treatment providers for seeing clients. And that could be individuals, groups, family members, and Washington also provides funding, full funding for those who need residential treatment. There are only a few residential programs across the country for people who do need inpatient treatment services and they range from 30 to 60 day programs. So if you need more information about those, we'd be happy to share that with you as well. Yep. Um, I also just wanted to share with you, I have linked in the slides in the resource section, a few videos for you. And you guys had asked about neurobiology. This is one on, it, it's an actual live brain scan in this video of just, it's just one person, but it's a good demonstration of the overall theme uh, that they find with gambling that the brain gets a dopamine release just from anticipating what an outcome could be before the outcome is ever delivered. 
There's dopamine for every bet made while they're waiting to find out what it is. There's dopamine for every win and there's dopamine for every loss disguised as a win. So that's a lot. It kind of helps explain why this is so addicting sometimes. It's understandable that a person um, can get hooked on this. Also, one of the great resources we've included in here um, is this Brain Connections. And this little video here um, gives you an overview of how gambling affects the brain. And for those of you who specialize in substances, it's going to seem very familiar because it's the same. So great educational video to use with clients as well. So thank you all for your attention and your presence. And uh, we really appreciate you giving us this time. And I hope that what you've got here is very useful and you can put it into practice right away. Thank you, Tana and Maureen. We really appreciate your time today and uh, the great list of resources and um, you monitoring the, the chat box. It seems like we got through all the questions, which is wonderful. I just wanted to give a, a couple of reminders please fill out our evaluation survey for today's webinar by clicking on the link within the email we'll be sending out later today, or I've also posted the link in the chat box. Um, and be sure to join us for our next webinar on September 29th. The topic is still to be determined, but we should have some more information and a flyer posted on our website within the next week or so. Um, and thank you everyone for your time today. We, we appreciate you joining us and um, Thank you to our presenters. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.